So thanks again for joining us for this webinar on community birthing care solutions. Our conversation today will be moderated by a Pulitzer Center grantee, Jenna Kuntz. Jenna is a staff reporter at Native News Online, where she covers stories impacting Indigenous people from across the U.S. and Canada. For her most recent Pulitzer-supported project, she reported on the rise of Indigenous doulas in a Seattle community. Our panel today is comprised of some wonderful community birthing experts. Cami Goldhammer has spent nearly 20 years serving urban Native families. She is a clinical social worker, a lactation consultant, and full-spectrum Indigenous doula based in Seattle. Cami is the founder and chair of the Native American Breastfeeding Coalition of Washington and founding executive director of Hummingbird Indigenous Family Services. And Cami was featured in Jenna's reporting project. We're all, also joining us today are two midwives from grantee Karen Kaminsky's project, Black Pregnant Women Are Turning to Midwives for Personalized Care and a Better Chance at Survival, which is focused on some um, midwives specifically in the Hampton, Virginia region. Victoria Buchanan is a certified nurse midwife at Sintera Midwifery Specialist. Caring for women during pregnancy and birth is a cornerstone of her career as a nurse midwife. She also provides routine care for women from adolescence through menopause. Nicole Wardlaw is a certified nurse midwife with Jamie Birth and Wellness Services in Sintera. She has over 16, experiences, 16 years of experience in health education, full scope, midwifery services in private, public, and military facilities, and clinical faculty advisory. I'll hand it over to Jenna to begin our discussion for today. Yes, hello everyone. Thanks for that introduction, Michaela, and welcome. Um, I think that what makes the most sense is to have you three panelists introduce uh, maybe in order of how you appear on my screen. So Nicole, Cami, and then Victoria, introduce how you came to uh, birth work. Well, so I came into birth work um, based on my own personal experience. I, with my first child, I had preeclampsia and my physician that was taking care of me didn't explain anything to me. A lot of stuff was done to me without having any education. And my one of my really good friends was also pregnant at the same time and she too was going through a high risk pregnancy with preterm labor and i came away from that experience thinking that i would never want anybody else to go through the same things that we went through and if there was anything in my power i would want to take care of people educate them empower them inform them and I actually was headed down the path of being an OBGYN physician because I didn't even know that midwives were a thing. And other than in olden days, that that was what you know people did. My mother and the rest of her generation were born in the South and they had midwives that caught them. And so when I, there was a midwife in my community, I was living in a very rural community in South Carolina. I had started my prerequisites for medical school and there was a midwife who was taking care of people in the community. She was the only person doing any type of obstetric and gynecological care. And so my personal doctor said, well, hey, why don't you go talk to her? See if you like what she's doing. Maybe she'll even let you shadow her and see because everybody doesn't necessarily like OB when they get to it. And so I shadowed her, I talked to her, and I was like, oh yeah, no, this is exactly what I want to do. I don't want to be a physician. I thought that was my only option, but I decided that I wanted to be a midwife. And that was how I got here. Awesome. All right. Um, I just want to quickly introduce myself in Dakota because that's my um, protocol when, I, when speaking to a new group of people. So uh, I just want to say, I'm Peti Washte Mi Takiapi, Kami Goldhammer Makiapi, Dama Kota Wia, Sisituan Wapetuan Homacha. So good day, relatives. I'm Kami. Uh, I am Dakota, a Dakota woman. So you she, her pronouns, and uh, my tribe is Sisituan Wapetano Yate from South Dakota. Um, but I, I'm really grateful to be here and be here with Nicole and Victoria and of course you, Jenna. Um, 
I came into birth work uh, very similarly, similar path to Nicole. There's many of us that kind of come in from having our own personal experiences. And so I don't have much to, you know, add in there can just echo what she said. Um, But I do want to kind of share how I got, because I think the community work is relevant and how I got into serving community. Um, You know, I grew up, I, I'm native. I grew up native, like grew up in the community. Um, And so I always say like my most relevant experience isn't being a native mom, but being a native child. And, you know, my experience of, um, of, yeah, just, you know, needing more support as a child and uh, wishing my parents had more support for their, you know, the reality that they were parenting in. Um, And uh, yeah, so I always wanted to work in community. Uh, Similar to Nicole, I wanted to be a therapist. And I thought the only way to do that was by getting your master's in psychology and, you know, kind of going that route. And had someone that told me about social work. And uh, after doing a little bit of research, um, after first being very turned off saying, I'm not going to take kids, I don't want to do that, I uh, decided to that uh, MSW was the right path for me. And I'm just so grateful for um, the the variety of opportunities that being a social worker has allowed me to allowed me to do. But yeah, like like Nicole had, uh, you know, always been committed to serving Native moms and families, but uh, my own my own birthing and parenting experience really changed my life um, and and kind of put me. I say I was already on this path, but it's the one that took me on. Like, no, now you're you're going this way. So, yeah. So thanks to my oldest daughter, Dylan, for that. myself. Um, my name is Victoria Buchanan. Um, the way that I came into birth work, well, I always knew I wanted to work with moms and babies and I went to nursing school. So I was like, I'm going to be an l and nurse. That's what I'm going to want to do. And maybe I'll go become a nurse practitioner. I didn't know that midwife was even an option because it's not even advertised, not only in our communities, but in our schools either. But when I was an L&D nurse, I kept on seeing these horrible outcomes to people of color. And I was always feeling so helpless. Like, no matter what I did at the bedside, it couldn't undo nine months of prenatal care. It couldn't undo picking up a provider who didn't support them. And then I, these patients wanted to have good experiences. And they ended up having to just settle for just a healthy mom and a healthy baby. Then when one of my coworkers was actually studying to a midwife, I had never, one, had never seen a black midwife. Two, didn't know it still existed. And she kind of like it inspired me to like go and look a little bit further. Through my journey, I realized that my great grandmother was actually a midwife in Jamaica. And I always feel like there was a calling that was already there. And I was just able and had the opportunity and privilege to answer that call. And that's my story. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, It's so cool to hear the through lines of like meeting a need, a a personal experience, and also tracing it back, Victoria, I've heard from other doulas through Cami's um, program of Hummingbird of of women, and even the photographer, Cami, that photographed uh, for the project that we worked on together. She um, is from Costa Rica, and we're actually, so we're going to show some of the photos right now. And Jessica had said the same thing as you, Victoria, that she didn't know that it was in her lineage that her grandfather was a birth work uh, professional as well, but she always felt called to it and called to photograph it as well. Um, so while we show some photos of our work, of both my project and the project that Victoria and um, and Nicole were featured in, I'm going to set the scene of the problem here. So because this is a this is a seminar about um, solutions in birth work, I think it's first important to establish what the problem is. So um, in maternal health care in the United States, the problem is that Black and Indigenous mothers are at least three times more likely to die in and around childbirth than their white counterparts. And this is just a general statistics. This, this isn't including specific areas. Like, for example, in the project that I worked on with Cami was a result of a Washington Health Board uh, report that showed that Indigenous women in Washington state are eight and a half times more likely to die uh, in and around childbirth than their white counterparts. And the same is true of Black women across the United States in different pockets of America. 
And that heightened risk is equally shared among Black and Indigenous women, regardless of income, education, or geographical location. So factors that are typically what we call protective factors, I learned this lingo from Cami, uh, don't apply if you're Black and Indigenous in America. So that means that the problem is racism, not race. So teeing that up to talk about the solutions that all three of you do and the great work you do in your birthing communities, um, I think it's also important to establish what we're talking about here. So the different categories of a midwife, an OB, and a doula. Um, so maybe, Cami, can you start and talk about what your role, what you can do and cannot do in your role? And then we can switch to Victoria and Nicole to say the same. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I apologize for walking around. My internet was glitching up. Uh, so I had to move to my daughter's room where it's the best. So <laughs> apologize for that. Um, so yeah, so, uh, in, uh, I will kind of describe how, what we, our definition of a doula, which is indigenous doula. So there might be broader definitions of doulas too, that other people might use, but, um, we see really see ourselves as indigenous doulas is different. Um, really what we do is fulfill the traditional role of our aunties, um, we are non-medical providers, so we do no medical anything, um, but uh, kind of thinking back culturally, traditionally in our communities prior to colonization, what would happen when someone had a baby is they would be surrounded by the aunties, right? Everyone would come and take care of them and love them and feed them and take care of their home so that mom and baby can just bond and attach and rest and recover and establish a great milk supply, right? And, and the aunties were the ones who really helped facilitate that postpartum ceremony. So as doula, as indigenous doula as at Hummingbird, that's a lot of what we do. Um, we, uh, yeah, again, don't provide any medical support, although we really do see our work as uh, traditional work. Um, and so we will talk about things like traditional medicines that are within our knowledge base. So definitely being clear about like what we know and what we don't know. Um, and then I'm also an IBCLC or a lactation consultant. And so, uh, which is like a, a, a health professional. And so there, and also as a licensed social worker, there's a little bit blending of scope depending on who's being served, you know, or who the doula is. So for example, if I'm your doula and there's breastfeeding things going on, I can kind of handle things differently than maybe a doula who's a breastfeeding counselor, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, we provide emotional, spiritual, physical, and mental support through the perinatal period. Uh, we're also full spectrum doulas. And so that means we support people um, regardless of the outcome of their pregnancy and really pregnancy status. So, you know, we have a number of families that are trying to conceive, um, people who are terminating, pre uh, terminating pregnancies. Um, we provide those supports, but most people are choosing to parent and we want to support them through that process. Thanks, Cami. Um, and Victoria and Nicole, I don't know how you want to divvy this up, but can you talk about the role of OBs and midwives and how they differ and why someone might seek their care? Sure. Um, I think the easiest way to distinguish a midwife from like the basics is that from an OB, is that we are not surgeons. We do not perform any surgical procedures. So we focus on the whole woman, but not from the surgical aspect. That is really a terrible description of what midwives do, but to distinguish what we can't do is surgery. Now, what do midwives actually provide is that we can take care of women from adolescence all the way through menopause. We can take care of them for like annual exams, we can do birth control, we can do certain procedures, we can do prenatal care, take care of you during labor, deliver your baby, and do postpartum care and family planning as well. That's just from a scope perspective. So people ask, what's the difference between an OB and a midwife from that perspective? The care is completely different. We are, we midwifery care is very much relationship-based. So yes, the very basic procedure of making sure that her health pregnancy is healthy is quite simple and very like prescriptive of what you need to do. But we care about the whole person, not just like what's going on in their pregnancy, but what's going on with their life, their 
social ethics, who's their support, what do they need? It goes deeper than just like, okay, baby's heart rate sounds fine. We'll see you in two weeks. We want to know what's important to them and their priorities in birth and what do they need, what past traumas they've gone through, what we need, what special considerations we need to bring into each and every birth to make sure we take care of the whole person. I think one of the things that the hallmark of midwifery is that we listen to our clients. And so not to say that OBs don't listen to their clients, but we very much so center them in their care. And we strongly believe in informed decision-making so and shared decision-making. So instead of speaking at our clients, we talk with them. And our visits tend to be longer. We tend to, like she said, have a very holistic approach. So when someone is <clears throat> dealing with, say, social issues, stressors, or whatever, we talk to them about that and how it impacts their health versus isolating separate things. You know, someone who's having continued nausea and vomiting. I'm like, okay, well, what's going on? What's happening with you? Is this something that's truly organic or are you having, you know, a stressful life where you are not eating like you should, you're not resting like you should. And we start looking at all aspects of that person's life and health before we just target one specific thing and say, okay, well here, take a pill. Like, let's look at what could be causing this versus it being just an organic thing that we fix with a medication. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and, and leads into the next question, which is, can each of you talk about the outcome of your care? Like uh, what the ideal circumstances and how um, doula and midwifery care can make a difference in maternal health and how you've seen it make a difference in maternal health in your careers. Well, because I, I always talk about how we're relationship built. I find that because our my patients like us, they want to come back and they are more likely to stay in care, especially with my younger clients. We were focused on what's important to them so we can build that relationship. They're more likely to stay in care they're more likely to report symptoms when they feel like they're not going to be like, they're not bothering us. We're, they're not feeling judged for their circumstances. They don't understand anything. If their education level isn't like the perfect level, they we meet them where they are. So because of all those things, they feel more likely to continue their prenatal care. They are also more likely to get the birth experience that they want. If it is of course safe for both mom and baby. So one of the things that we pride ourselves on is having lower C-section rates for people who are low risk. So if you are low risk, you're not going to have a higher chance of having a C-section because we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that this baby comes out vaginally as long as it's safe for both mom and baby. I was like, Nicole, do you want to add anything to Victoria or should I jump in? Um, I'll, well, I'm going to also, yeah, let me also add that even when we have high-risk patients, because we take care of high-risk patients as well, our outcomes tend to be better. Um, because I think that clients that seek midwifery care are very motivated and we take the time to educate them about what's happening with them. So our, say, a gestational diabetic that we've had lots of conversation with and we talk to them about being diet controlled and really explain to them what can happen, right? That they will say, okay, well, let me look at my diet. Let me really pay attention because we've given them the tools that they need for success. And at the end of the day, even I always bring up the MIST study, which was the midwifery integration into the system study that said that midwifery care reduce those healthcare disparities. And right now we're in a maternal health crisis in the black community. And when we have midwifery care, that those healthcare, those like outcomes are better and the disparity is reduced. And we're not having the same kinds of outcomes that we see on a national level, but even within our own practices. Last year I had 34 births. I only had maybe a C-section in those 34. Um, my babies were all fat, juicy babies. I had an 11 pound baby. 
you know, that was a vaginal birth. So we're not having low birth weight babies. We're not having having the preterm births. We, you know, things happen. So, you know, there's always an outlier, but for the most part, we're not seeing the same numbers with our practice that are seen nationally. The national average for a cesarean, like the national what rate for C-section is 30 something percent. I think ours was, what was it, Victoria, at the practice? 16%. And we had, at, at Centera, we had over 120 babies. Right. Our VBAC rates are good. So it's something about just that personalized care that clients get. High risk, low risk. I feel like even our high risk patients need midwifery care because they need that education. They need that love. They need that time in order to be able to manage. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the doula. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you both. Um, yeah. And we're, I mean, I will say like as doulas too at Hummingbird, I mean, we're huge fans of midwifery and we definitely, I mean, one of the first things we do is talk to our families at intake about where they plan on birthing, who are their providers. And we have no problem being like, we don't want you to go there. We, you know, like they're, that they're not safe for us. Like I, that's the benefit, a big benefit of being a doula and being outside of a mainstream healthcare system is we can kind of, you know, be a little bit more vocal around that. Um, but we know, you know, we all know that there's providers that we don't want black and brown indigenous people going to, you know, it's just not safe. And so, um, yeah. So kind of going back to your question, Jenna, um, cause I could have totally taken that on another tangent around kind of what's our ideal. It was like our de- ideal, right. Of what it would look yeah, like. Yeah. How you see doula care making a difference in maternal health. Yeah. Um, so very, I mean, very similar to what Victoria and Nicole shared around being very family centered, we call our clients relatives. So for us, it's a relative centered model. Um, For us, the pregnant person is the one who we are, is our relative, our client. We of course serve the whole family um, in a variety of ways and include them in a variety of ways. And like our focus is the pregnant person, right? Is the mom. Um, We uh, kind of like my ideal and where I really see things making a difference is the sooner people can come to us, the better, right? So early, early access to a doula. Um, and that's a, also a difference between like in the way we do things and like a mainstream doula model. We work with people as soon as they find out they're pregnant. We work with, I mean, that's how we have people who are trying to conceive, you know, maybe we supported them through a miscarriage and then now we're working on conception again. So really working with families as early as they want a doula. Um, we do provide home-based services. So we're going to people's homes. We're doing, you know, one to uh, one visit a week, usually sometimes every other week, depending on how, um, how far along in their pregnancy they are, you know, so earlier in pregnancy, we might spread it out, but as we get closer, we're doing a lot more visits. And then of, po- of course, postpartum is where things get more intense as, for, for on our end. And we're usually spending, um, between four and 12, 12 hours a week with a family. So, uh, my kind of standard, uh, hope for our families is they're getting at least one, four hour visit a week, if not two or three, and we'll do that based on the family's needs and where they're at. Um, you know, where we really see the difference or where our work makes an impact, um, specifically around, maternal mortality, um, child, infant mortality, um, birth, you know, satisfaction, like around their birth and, and postpartum experience, um, is really being present. I mean, that's just a big part of it, you know, just being there for families, empowering families to make decisions that's best for them, informing them of all of their choices so that they can, you know, make that, make that decision that works for them. Um, being an advocate, 
um, stepping in when we need to, we will absolutely do that. And then just really giving them that unconditional anti-love and really modeling for them what we want them to be able to do for their babies, which is just unconditionally love them, right? And so even if we're there for just a, a couple hours a week, we hope that that is a time where the family can just love on their baby and not have to worry about all the other things going on in their home. Um, I do also want to mention just our other services that are provided because I think that that's where we really get the dose response, you know, for kind of like a, a research language to use. But we know that indigenous doulas make a difference. We know that mid midwives from your own community make a difference. Um, and when you put those two things together, right? Like that sort of magic really happens. And we see that too at Hummingbird. We have home visiting, um, which typically picks up when the doula relationship ends. So if a family is still needing some additional support, particularly around their mental health, then they would be moved on to um, home visiting, which would work with them until their child's three years old. Um, the other thing that we offer is a guaranteed income program, um, which we're, is still open, but that really addresses basic needs, which for our state maternal mortality report, which you um, referenced earlier, Jenna, uh, you know, lists eight things that we can do in our state to prevent maternal mortality. And one of them is provide basic needs. And so our guaranteed income program really gets at that. And that provides $1,250 a month, no strings, uh, no strings attached cash to families starting at least 12 weeks pregnant until their third birthday, the child's third birthday. So it's this, a really significant amount of money that really makes a difference. And we hope that that lowers stress and allows the family to love and attach with their baby more freely. Um, and we believe that that heals historical trauma, which is kind of like our, our end game, um, is that intergenerational healing that we want to see happen. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, you know, where I really see like when, when a family can get all of those things, right. And a, a midwife that loves them and a healthy birth. I mean, that just makes such a huge difference for a family. That actually brings to mind another question, Cami, which I'm interested in to hear from Victoria and Nicole, because we know that um, access to care is a barrier to maternal health as well. And I wonder how your programs serve um, low income families in Virginia. Are you able to speak to that? Um, so I'm going to say that when you start talking about low income families, um, I think that there is an assumption about what a low income family looks like. And that is an assumption. Um, you know, the average Medicaid client is not the stereotypical client. And I think that that's one way that, like the one thing that we need to look at in terms of who, when you talk about low income and what that really looks like. Um, but when, for me, I wanna change this to more, when you look at culturally congruent care, because you know I'm very focused on the crisis that's in my community and why I even started a practice because I want it to be a safe space for women who are in my community, um, melanated women, black, brown, whatever, to be able to come into a space where they don't have to code switch, where they don't have to have a different representation of themselves and that they could be truly organically themselves and feel comfortable talking to me about whatever is going on in their lives so that I can care for them in the best possible way that I could, you know? So yeah, like when we start having that conversation, we talk about people who are low income, that actually when you look at the stats, it's college educated black women that die more than anybody else. And so the question is why, right? They're not low income, they have jobs, they're educated, right? They have access to care, but they're more likely to die than someone who comes from a low-income situation. Um, 
I, I appreciate that, that distinction, Nicole. Victoria, did you want to add something? So, and like, besides the problem of maternal health, we do have an access issue in especially different areas. And when we talk about people who are low income, what I really find out is that it's not going to have access to care. It's hard to bring them access to midwifery care. Because depending on what, like, for example, and I'm not trying to speak for, like, Cole, like, but for people who do home birth, most of the time they have to pay out of pocket because they don't get the full insurance coverage. So when we have people who are willing to actually go and take the time to work and get credentialed with the insurances, it opens up opportunities for those clients who also definitely need that pair. And yes, it may be a little bit more inconvenient to have to wait for insurances to pay you back, but you were opening up all this access to people who actually need it. For my practice, one, one of the benefits of being part of the hospital system is that people who are on Medicaid are kind of our bread and butter. We love Medicaid clients and we are, because we're a hospital-based system, we can take all the patients who use Medicaid. And most people who are Medicaid have a hard time getting access to some practices that have midwives because they don't have to have a certain photos of how many different payers they want to take. We don't have that problem. So I would say it is not an exaggeration to say that 75% of my population is on Medicaid and they are having excellent outcomes. And so this is not, this is showing that it doesn't matter what your income level is, if you have access to good care, you can still have excellent outcomes. That also, so something else that I think is important to touch on that came through a lot in my reporting with Cami is the idea of culturally competent care. And this sounds like something similar, Nicole, to what you were talking about of having a safe space and having people come as they are um, and seeing, yeah, so someone that has maybe been through similar experiences, treating them and able to relate to them on a different level than, than not. And so I wonder if you could talk about, um, if each of you can talk about that, that level of culturally competent care and how your practice of bringing culture and understanding and worldview to birth work, like how you see that impact translated through clients and families. Cool, I can go ahead, cool. Um, so yeah, um, when I think of like cultural competence to it, such a hard word, you know, because you really, unless you're from a community, you can't truly ever reach competency. Um, and, you know, even within that, and I'm sure like um, Victoria and Nicole could, could identify with this is even within our own communities, there's still so much diversity, right? Like just because I'm serving Native families does not mean that I don't have to gain trust, right? I might have a little bit less of a barrier to go through. It might be a little, you know, I might get one foot in the door easier, but I still have to really prove that I am going to be there for the family. There's still going to be, thing, you know, there's always going to be the like, oh, I'm urban. I'm from this tribe. I'm from that, you know, like that kind of stuff, right? So, um, you know, that's where I think like really family-centered or again, like we say relative-centered care is most important. Um, we have families at Hummingbird that we serve that um, really run the gamut of, you know, maybe on one end of the spectrum, they just want a native doula. They don't really, you know, maybe don't have a strong connection to their culture. They maybe don't want to do a lot of traditional things. You know, they might not want to participate in ceremony. That just might not be. They just want someone that has some sort of shared lived experience in that space with them, right? And so that's great. We'll do that. And then we have other family, you know, other other relatives that we serve who are kind of like on the other end of the spectrum where they want all that. They really, you know, and this is common when people are growing their families is it's a time to think about like, what am I going to pass down to this next generation, right? Like, what is this kid going to have from me? Um, and culture is often one of the things that people long for, right? I think of like being pregnant and bringing in a new generation is that time of reflection of kind of like, oh, what are the things I missed? I wish I had. And what are the things I want to pass down? And so we have, a, and especially living in an urban area, 
you know, we have a very diverse native population here in the Seattle area because we were a, a relocation city, which was a, a 1950s uh, government policy to move native people to urban areas um, to force assimilation. And so Seattle was one of those. So that's why we have a really diverse, you know, urban community here. And so, um, you know, and I only have four doulas plus me, right? And so we can be a direct cultural match for the hundreds of tribal communities that are represented here. Um, but we do have a lot of knowledge. You know, we do represent different tribal communities. We do have varying degrees of knowledge. And we've also been gifted a lot of thing, you know, a lot of what we would call like knowledge or ceremony or songs that we're able to bring to a family if that's something they want. Um, and then part of my work nationally allows me to reach out to other, you know, it's like if I have a Navajo client, like, oh, you better believe I'm on the phone with my bestie, Kim, who's Navajo, who's going to be able to tell, you know, get me the go speed bracelets and, you know, help me get a cradle board, um, a Navajo cradle board, those kinds of things so that I can do things as culturally specific for that family as possible. Um so yeah, it really it really does vary for the population we serve. Um and and most people kind of fall in between those two. They're like, "Yeah, I'd love to use a cradle board, but they don't necessarily want to like, you know, have a traditional a traditional home birth in a teepee where like the man's not even allowed, right? Like that kind of thing. So it's just, it's really going to vary from community to community and person to person. What we do is um ask what the family wants. And, and what they want, we will try our best to fulfill those, those needs and desires as much as possible. I really like what you just said about asking what the family wants, because that's how I feel like we can provide culturally competent care. Because like I said, we're not a monolith. People who I serve, they come from different backgrounds. They all have different experiences, different upbringings and what's important to them so I want to know like who's important to be in your birth room so some people they don't want to have anybody else but sometimes birth is a huge family event and it may be not best with the hospital policies I'm visiting but like okay cool then make sure you can have these people pick your three tell everyone else to be in the waiting room if you have all 20 them in the waiting room bring them in one at a time we'll work it out we'll make sure that you feel comfortable that you don't have to wear what you what they're told they tell you to wear in the hospital that you can wear what makes you feel comfortable who is what do you need to relax it's not just like what the prescriptive thing and one thing i really like to tell people is that stop letting people tell you be quiet when you're in labor if you need to vocalize let your energy out that's okay and whatever you need to do to cope with your labor experience and what you need to make sure it's a good experience is what's going to work on make it happen if we can. There are limitations, but we try to work around them to make it the best we possibly can. I'm going to agree with Victoria on that. Um, and even like she said, we're not a monolith. Victoria's background is Caribbean. My family is Southern Black. And so we have, even though we are both, you know, Black women in this country, we definitely have very different type of experiences in our you know, upbringing that is different. Like we're all the same, but we're also very different. Um, but the key thing is, what would you like your birth to look like? What would you want your care to look like? I'm fluent in Spanish, but I will never be able to be, you know, culturally co competent, like Cami said, I'm not Afro-Latina. So I don't understand that lived experience of someone who's Dominican or Puerto Rican or Panamanian, because that's not my background. I can speak the language so that I can help to communicate and, and maybe take some of that level of stress away for someone who's first generation here that does not speak the language, but I don't understand their lived experience. And the only thing I can do is say, how can I help you? What is something that's important to you, right? My Muslim clients, what would you like to happen with your birth? What is the tradition here, you know? And so those are the kinds of things that when you are taking care of someone, ask them, what does birth look like in your culture? And what do you want to also happen with your birth or in your care? But 
also like move out of the way and be respectful of some of these things. Um, I had a client who I had to transfer and based on her religion, the women needed to have their heads covered. And I was so happy to see the staff honor their wish, which for the first, I was like, oh my gosh, like you're really doing this in this hospital? But every female member from the nurses to the physicians that came in, they respected what the client wanted. And it's something that small, that's a very small gesture, means a huge amount of, like it's it's huge. Just having that one little thing that you're willing to do to make someone comfortable and happy. Thank you for those responses. I'm gonna ask one last question, but this is a PSA to all um, folks listening in to um, feel free to write questions in the chat or in the Q&A function and I'll ask those at the end as well. But my last question is um, about advice for both, what would you each say as advice for um, pregnant black or indigenous mothers seeking care? And then also on the flip side of that of like, listeners who are interested in getting involved, they're supporting um, community health solutions. Are there any bills that folks can get behind or what is a way that um, listeners that are maybe just learning about this or maybe are on their own journey and, and have supported this in their community all along to um, further your work and work of their community doulas and midwives as well? I think the first thing for the pregnant people who are coming up and wondering what they can do is you need to talk to your provider. You, you need to ask them questions. And I hate to say interview, but really interview them. Ask them what kind of, what do they support? And be very, I have to be very detailed, but really ask them if this is important to you, you need to ask them up front and say, is that just for you or for everyone in your practice? Because if you're not there, others will be supported. And if they... I feel like if someone gives you a lot of pushback or they don't like that you're even asking questions, run. That that is a red flag because your care should be shared. It is your body and your life. So even if they can't do something, they're acting like you're crazy for asking something. And eat, you can say it in a respectful way, but hear what you're saying. If they tell you that, oh, just trust me, that that's a red flag. Like you are not a child. You are, this is your body and you need to be active in your health care. So if you can't be a part of the decision-making pro process, there's something wrong and it's probably not a good fit for you. And you were asked, I forgot to say that, your question. I'm sorry. The second half was about uh, interested participants and how folks that are interested in supporting community birth care can further your mission. So I think it was just more about like telling people about there are options out there that you don't have to just choose the standard traditional way. You don't have to only birth in one location. There's not just to go to the hospital each time. If you want to choose, if home birth is right for you, if you're an appropriate candidate, these options still exist. And to be just be willing to ask the questions and support when you hear people doing this, spread the news that, hey, there's a community worker in my community that I want to make sure that you know that these services are available. Tell you, if you find a provider who you know is supportive and makes people have good experiences, spread the word because we, most of our clients come from word of mouth. We hear, oh, I had a good experience. You should come here because they will treat you right. That's how they can help promote it, even if they're not actively part of birth work. I agree with Victoria. I tell people all the time that your provider as if your life depends on it, because it does. And even when someone wants to talk to me, I'm like, look me up. You can look me up. Look and see if I've had some type of lawsuit, if there have been board charges against me, you know, what Google reviews say or say, like, look me up. And anyone that you are going to be in care with, you need to know. What if it's a OB? What is their C-section rate? If you're going to the hospital, what's their C-section rate? What do they support? What do they not support? So that you know what you're getting into and you're going in eyes wide open, right? The second question is, what can people do to support? So I'm a policy person. When you know who your legislators are, 
Know who you have in office, in your district, you who you are the constituent, like you're the constituent for somebody. Know what their voting record is, especially on the issues that you find important. Education, healthcare, you know, all of these things, but in particular, since we're talking about this care, find out whether or not certified professional midwives, certified midwives, and certified nurse midwives, what they're allowed to do in your state. If this is a doula and midwifery friendly state, is this a maternal child care health friendly state? What kind of laws are in place where women have the right to choose what happens with their own bodies? And if the people are not aligned with what you believe, then they don't need to be in office representing you. So you can always talk to your representative, House and Senate, and say, hey, you voted on this, but this is not in line with what I believe, right? Talk to your your representatives. Talk to your senators on a local level, town council, you know, know who those people are and what policies are in place. Because if we do not say anything and we keep these people in office, then we're complicit with what happens in our state. Awesome. Um, I, so let's see, things that I would want parents to know. Um, this is where I, I'm, you know, you got to remember I'm a therapist at my core. So, you know, the, the thing that I want parents to know, particularly indigenous and black, black parents, um, is to know that they're the perfect parent for their baby, um, that they are worthy and deserving of being treated with care and respect and love, um, that their birth is a ceremony and it's sacred and it should be treated as such, um, that just by being them, that they are enough um, to get all the great things that they deserve, you know, like that's just something that I really feel strongly about parents knowing and believing deep down in their core, um, that they are perfect. So that's my, my thing I want for parents. Um, as far as policies go, um, you know, uh, many states are working toward Medicaid coverage for doulas. Um, uh, Victoria Nicole, I forget which one brought up kind of um, even payment for midwives. Like that's another, you know, definitely a, a challenge uh, across the country to appropriate compensation for our midwives through Medicaid um, and other insurance companies. Um, but that's, you know, Medicaid specifically, that's a policy level challenge, you know, the challenge that's handled at the state. Um, advocating within your state for doulas to be fairly compensated for uh, through medical Medicaid um, is huge and really, really, really important for um, being able, you know, because not everyone can run a nonprofit like I do and hire doulas, right? Many people are, are, on the streets hustling, right? Looking for clients, trying to get payment, trying to run a business. And those are not necessarily lessons that we as Black and Indigenous women specifically are trained to do, right? We don't learn those things growing up. And so you have a lot of doulas that want to do this work, but they just don't know how to how to get compensated. So it's a side hustle and that makes it hard for their business and, and their uh, their business to grow. And so Medicaid coverage is, can be really helpful in decreasing those barriers to um, accessing doulas um, for Medicaid um, recipients. Um, you know, also just, you know, I always got to plug guaranteed income because that's something that's being talked about at different state, you know, at different states, my state of Washington, it's currently um, going through the legislative process. Uh, and so, you know, we really know that giving parents no strings attached money works and it makes a difference and it's very 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 important and so working and advocate you know looking and seeing if there's a gbi um at at your state level is anyone talking about it 
talking to legislators, seeing, you know, what their interest is in that and um, supporting that, you know, those pilots happening can be really helpful because we can, we, you all, we cannot rely on white billionaires to do this. Like this is, you know, and that's, that's who's funding this work. Like that's not the way it is. Um, and, and specifically it's their wives that are doing it, their ex-wives. Right. And so, and that's just not a sustainable, um, a sustainable option for ending, um, maternal mortality and solving the, 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 reproductive justice issues that we're having. We cannot rely on ph philanthropists. This is a community responsibility and it is something that our government should be actively involved in. So that's what I got to say about that. <laughs> well said. I'm glad we talked about the policy aspect of it from, from both of you because I think that, that that's obviously a really important component of this all. Okay, I'm going to ask um, two questions here. So one of them, and this seems like it would be for you, Cami, uh, an anonymous attendee asked, since there is no state or national training for doulas, how do doulas within and across states stay connected, be in community with one another and share best practices slash continued education? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, that's really going to vary from the community, the doula community you're a part of. Um, you know, there are, I can speak specifically to like BIPOC doula organizations or, or um, grassroots organizing efforts um, where there really is like these very active communities. Um, in Washington state, we have several. Um, we have a lot of solidarity between our black and indigenous birthing people too, you know, our um, birth workers, um, you know, for, especially as an indigenous doula, I mean, or an indigenous birth worker starting almost 20 years ago. I mean, it was my black breastfeeding sisters who they like got me through that because I thought I was the only native person working on it. And it was that, you know, they're the ones who brought me in and were like, okay, yeah, like let's, let's work together. Um, and so, you know, finding, finding that grassroots, those grassroots connections, um, meetups, um, of course, social media, there's tons of Facebook groups, you know, being able to connect that way. And then, you know, I'm a, if you build it, they will come person. Almost everything I've done, I is been, there's a need and I'm very impatient. So I'm one to kind of like, start, you know, like I'll, I'll fulfill that need. And so if that's a need that you see in your community, which I'm sure it is, um, you can all like, you are worthy of ad, like doing this stuff. Right. I mean, we always, I mean, imposter syndrome, like I am not trying to like put any of these feelings or words on the question, the questioners, you know, like feelings, but it's really hard to wonder like, God, I'm a new baby doula. Like what's my place in starting something like this? Like, I, I promise you there's a need. If you feel there's a need, there's a need and we will wait forever for other people to start things. And we don't have time for that. Our babies are dying. Our moms are dying. So like the time is now. And so, um, yeah, I know that that was less of an answer and more of a pep talk, but really like it's, you got it, you can do it. Um, and, you know, there is some national, you know, there's some great, especially in the black community, some incredible organizations that work nationally around reproductive justice, um, Black Mamas Matter. Um, there's a ton of breastfeeding orgs, you know, black breastfeeding orgs. Um, we have less of a national presence in the native community or like national organization, but there is a group of us that are working on some things. So we're, you know, yeah, we're getting there. Thanks for that, Cami. Um, another question from a listener named Wanja Gathu. She asks, are alternative birth practitioners regulated? Where would one, for instance, channel their concerns if something goes wrong? So it depends on which practitioner you're speaking of. Um, we are licensed through our individual states, certified nurse midwives and certified fresh professional midwives. There are unlicensed midwives in certain states, which I can't speak to who regulates them, but we are regulated by either our boards of nursing, 
our boards of medicines or boards of midwifery, depends on what states you're in. Um, doulas, essentially, there's a sort of like Virginia has a certification board and they are now moving into how to regulate doulas in our state. Um, every state is different and other people, lactation consultants, they may have a license, but they, you know, I feel like every kind of group has a way of regulating themselves. And then if you're in the birth community, then if something is wrong, we will find out about it. <laughs> and, you know, for me, I know that someone can report me to the board of nursing and medicine because I'm regulated by the joint boards. Um, CPMs in our state are regulated by the board of medicine. That's who you would report to. And now that we have certified midwives, they're also regulated by the joint boards and you can report them as well. Everyone else, depending on if they have a license or a certification, have to, there's some type of accountability being out there. And there's always, you know, I hate to say it this way, but there's always social media because when people are out there doing all kinds of things, it tends to get back. So if you have someone out there who's doing crazy stuff and they're unsafe, the word gets out there. I, I just want to echo that. And that's exactly what I say as like an indigenous doula. And I also created a training called Indigenous Lactation Counselor, which is a five-day, 45-hour lactation education course. Um to train breastfeeding peer counselors who are indigenous. Um, and I am often asked like, what's your scope? What's our, like, what's our scope at the end of this? And I say as indigenous people, our scope is determined by what our community allows us to do and not do. And like Nicole said, our community can give scope and it can withdraw scope very quickly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so if you're giving, you know, if you're doing a good job, if you're, you know, I, uh, um, sharing good information, if you're doing good work, if you're not causing harm, um, that, that, you know, as a, as a doula or breastfeeding counselor, which are generally unregulated, there are kind of larger regulatory boards, but that's a whole other conversation around decolonization. Like I, I will never participate in something like that because I see this as traditional work. So I don't need Dona to certify me as a doula. Um, I, I, yeah, that I'm not looking for their, you know, anointing for me as a doula. Um, but, uh, but doing good work is really important. And yeah, just like Nicole said, it will, it goes very quickly. If you're doing a bad job, it will, it will spread like wildfire, wild, ah, wildfire and very quickly, no one will come to you because <laughs> we will all <laughs> Um, the last quick question I want to ask that I think is a relevant one is and can be applied to um, Victoria and Nicole as well, but this specific person is interested in being trained as an Indigenous doula. Um, they live and work in Virginia as a tribal health and wellness coordinator, and they want to know are there are any trainings you recommend, and I guess the same, like, are there any resources that each of y'all have to give listeners that are um, looking in into higher education in this work? Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to just share a couple of quick answers. So there are, um, there are a couple of indigenous doula trainings that are out there. Um, the first one is, uh, Zagi Duen, which is an Anishinaabe word, Anishinaabe Moan word. Uh, uh, I will tell you the first three letters are Z-A-A, -A, um, G, I don't speak it, but um, I can I can say it. But you can kind of start by googling or going onto Facebook and starting there. Um, that's led by um, my good friends Melissa and Candice, who um, are out of Winnipeg, Canada. So they travel all over the U.S. and Canada doing their um, their Indigenous doula training. Um, there's also an Indigenous doula training called Aunties on the Road. Um, which uh, which is out of kind of the Great Lakes area. Um, the Center for Indigenous Midwifery, which is based out of Washington State, has a doula training. Um, I know of several others that are being developed right now, but I won't share, you know, like I'll let them kind of announce that when they're ready, but there's several others that are being developed. Um, and uh, there's also um, the uh, couple of like, 
postpartum, Indigenous postpartum doula trainings. And then, of course, my my kind of side hustle, Indigenous lactation counselor, which is, again, a five-day breastfeeding peer counselor training for people that identify as Indigenous. Um, so those are, you know, some really good places to start. Um, you know, Virginia is going to, you know, it'll be harder to find something local. So it might be something that you have to attend remotely um, or take kind of what I would call a mainstream doula training and then work on gaining more knowledge around, you know, your your own cultural practices and uh, and and help to enhance what you learn through a mainstream model. Um, I say like figure out ways to get educated is any any way possible. You know, you can wait around for a long time waiting for an indigenous doula training to come to your community. Um, and and that's, again, we don't have time for that. So get it where you can. <laughs> I would also encourage you to reach out to your, lots of groups, at least in our area, we have a birth workers of color group, which we keep meeting and it involves all the birth workers of color now community midwives doulas lactation consultants so i don't know what part of virginia you are in but there i would look and see if you have a local or group in your area because we tend to stick together because we know that we need each other Um, before I wrap up here, Nicole, do you have any final resources? Um, I was going to mention what Victoria said, that just try to find your tribe in your area. Find the people who are doing what you're doing and align yourself with them because we all need each other to hold each other up. Sometimes, I mean, you can feel pretty isolated in the work that you're doing. But when you find your tribe, then you know that they are cheering you on, supporting you and keeping you accountable at the same time. Absolutely. And I think that's a perfect note to end on here. So I just want to thank all of you, Cami, Victoria, Nicole. That was wonderful and so interesting to hear more. And Jenna, thank you for guiding the conversation so well. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to um, share a recording of this with all participants here after um, in the next week or so. So I would definitely encourage you to share this out with your other um, contacts and communities and um, allow others to hear all of this wonderful expertise. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. And if you are able, we would definitely encourage you to consider becoming a Pulitzer Center champion to support our work, as well as supporting the work of our panelists and looking into their individual organizations. And then finally, I would really appreciate if you take just a few seconds here as we close up um, to complete the survey that comes up on your screen once the webinar has ended. Um, we're always trying to improve our events and we really appreciate any sort of feedback. So thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>